So thank you so much, uh, Omar and Leslie, for the invitation. Thank you for this presentation. It will be difficult to speak after this uh, presentation, I think. So I'm a very shy guy, so uh, I will read the text if I yeah, manage to. Uh, so what I would like to prove tonight is an extremely simple evidence. It's the fact that we live the same life as everything around us. Everything that surrounds you, no matter what the form, no matter the species, no matter the material, no matter the age, everything has the same identical life that goes through you. It is not just identical, but it is a life that has already gone through you several times just as your life is ready to pass to invest the bodies that surrounds you. So precisely for this reason, as a famous contemporary Amazonian thinker, Alton Krenak has reminded us several times, there is no environment, but just a continuum of life. And metamorphosis is actually the most important evidence of this. All life around us, outside of us, is the same that also exists within us. So, uh, the first time you experienced it was probably when you were children and you first noticed the cocoon through which a caterpillar turned into a butterfly. It is something that is difficult to understand. One and the same life is shared by two bodies, two bodies that have nothing in common anatomically, ethologically, ecologically. They have totally different shapes they have totally different customs. They inhabit totally different worlds. To repeat the words of a great naturalist of the last century, the insect is schizophrenically divided, divided between two bodies. The first of them is dedicated to nutrition and to the future of the individual, and it consists in, uh, of huge digestive tubes carried on caterpillar legs. The second, dedicated to the future of the species, consists of a flying machine dedicated to sex. Metamorphosis is only the mechanism that allows these two incompatible bodies to belong to the same individual. The miracle of metamorphosis is therefore the death of the same life that cannot be traced back to a precise anatomical identity, but neither to a specific world. The two bodies inhabit two completely different worlds. The first strip on Earth, the second flies. According to biologists, it is precisely to prevent adults and children from competing that the body changes so radically. So metamorphosis takes place just in, in a, according to uh, entomologists, just in order to avoid that, in a way, adults and children uh, are entering competitive uh, relationships. Uh, the same self, the same ego, can live in two incompatible bodies and two incompatible worlds. Imagine having sex, six legs for half of your life uh, and clinging to the ground eating leaves and for the, uh, uh, and for the other, other half of your life to flutter in the air having sex every, every two hours. You would expect, it's a beautiful life, actually. <laughs> it's at, at, at least the second one. Uh, the, you would experience life in a way that can never be reduced to the form of a body or to a specific world. Life for you will be what happens between bodies, what can circulate between different worlds. It, it is no longer a quality of a body or a quality of a world, but what is transmitted from body to body, from world to world, what flows freely between forms. Now, that's the metamorphosis. You encounter, you encounter two different, totally different bodies. You suppose that they have nothing in common, and yet they have the same life. They are the same me. They have the same intimacy that you have with the body of you when you were a, chi when you were a child. What I would like to show you today that is that this kind of relationship exists not only between the caterpillar and the butterfly, but also between all the bodies of the world. 
and between all the living bodies and the earth. Imagine all the living bodies, not only those that belong to a species, but those that belong to all species, not only those who live now, but also those who have lived since the beginning of life on earth, and those who will live in the future. They have the same relationship which, uh, with each other as caterpillars and butterflies. They are the same life that is transmitted from body to body, from species to species, from kingdom to kingdom. Now imagine all the living beings and the earth. Between these two immense bodies, there is also the same relationship that exists between the caterpillar and the butterfly. Life is only the butterfly of this enormous caterpillar that is Gaia, it is the metamorphosis of the planet. Now, what is the first step is to uh, understand, or to try to understand this miracle, what is exactly a metamorphosis? And let's look closer at insects. It is also interesting that in order to better, under, to, to, to better understand life on Earth, you have to, to look at this uh, very strange and very uh, horrible, uh, in a way, animals that are insects. Horrible in the sense that we are always uh, fighting against them, at least, uh, uh, at least uh, me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> they are everywhere, there are many, so I ate insects. I, 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 I didn't start to uh, study insects because of love in this case, it's not like plants, it, it really, I hate them. But they are extremely interesting. Uh, so they are everywhere, there are many, they are able to differentiate themselves from each other like no other class of living beings. An overwhelming majority of animal biodiversity is believed to be due to their anatomically, anatomical dandism. It is estimated that the number of the species ranges from six to 10 million. Their somatic imagination, however, is not limited to the invention of new specific identities of new species. Above all, they are able to sue such different bodies to each other during the same individual life that for a long time it was suspected that they were magical beings capable of passing from one species to another. It is as if they managed to condense in the formal plurality of a single individual existence the ability of multiplication of forms that exist among species. Insects make global biodiversity a matter, a matter of personal virtuosity. By transforming into a butterfly, every caterpillar produces in its life and from itself a morphological diversity that seems as marked as that which often exists between different species. They manage to domesticate in their own way of life the difference to which only the interspecific experience gives us access. They are the, master, the masters of metamorphosis, but this has not always been the case. They were not born with this talent. They have known how to make it over time, which makes their achievement even more incredible. The first insects did not have wings and did not undergo a metamorphosis. And there is that, that, that it's, that's the sign that there is nothing natural, regional, spontaneous about this ability. Now, why do they pass through this very strange process? It is the skin that is to blame. Imagine having, instead of your skin, so supple and fluffy, something similar to the shell of a car, or the steel arm of, of a Mazinger, or Astro the little robot. Imagine that you can lean on your skin, and as you lean on your skeleton, imagine that you can ask to, it to protect you, to give you a shape, a structure. Change your skin, in this case, would then literally mean changing shape and changing uh, a body. For a body of this type, any form of growth is a metamorphosis. Now, in this condition, uh, 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 no, sorry. Uh, for centuries, the metamorphosis of insects has been the place of astonishment and the difficulty of thinking this evidence. So the, the first uh, or the, 
the first way or the first enigma to solve when you're when when you are looking to this kind of process is the fact that uh, uh, they are repeating what, what normally takes place during birth, and the evidence of that is uh, at, at least in the past was the fact that actually when they, they are producing a, a cocoon, they are in a way producing a second time an egg, so a sort of postnatal egg after the birth. So. In a way, growth for these insects, for these uh, uh, animals, uh, looks like the repetition of the mystery of birth. Uh, and the, the causes that define an individual's devel development are the same as those that de determine birth. And we will see why, in order to pass through the metamorphosis, the insects have to build a sort of second postnatal egg. From this point of view, a life which is able of metamorphosis is a life uh, which never leaves the embryonic state entirely, or vice versa. What we call the embryonic state, state is in fact a permanent condition, condition. The insect is the form of life in which the egg is not only at the beginning, but extends its existence, returns in different forms, is something that follows birth, and it is not limited to precede it. As a very famous entomologist uh, last century says, uh, 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 Carol Williams, I quote, in the metamorphosi metamorphosi me metamorphosing insect, the embryonic mechanism becomes accessible in a post embryonic environment. And of, um, and of course, the metamorphosis would be only the transposition of the morphogenetic mechanism of the embryo into the post embryonic life of the insect. It was William Harvey, so the, the famous uh, uh, 17th century uh, biologist, the first one who discovered the circulation of blood, among other stuff, who first formulated such an idea, which has long been caressed by modern anthropology. Harvey calls vegetal principle the specific, I quote, bodily substance in which life is potentially enclosed and something existing in itself but remains capable of transforming itself into a form of life through the action of an intrinsically present principle, end of quote. So the egg and seed of plants are for Harvey the most common forms of this primordia, and Harvey considers the caterpillar as a form of this vegetative principle and, following, uh, and is following the Aristotelian tradition, which first considered the larva, the caterpillar, as a sort of soft egg still growing. So the larva is a kind of egg deposited before time, an embryogenic genic process that takes place outside the mother's body, or to say it with a great modern entomologist, Antonio Berlese, a caterpillar is a free circulating embryo. For Harvey, a caterpillar, so I give just in this section a couple of uh, biological uh, details which are a little bit complicated perhaps, but it's just a very, very short section. Then. So for Harvey, a caterpillar is a middle way between the perfect egg and the imperfect egg. In relation to the egg itself, that is at, at its origin, a caterpillar is an animal with movement and sense and is capable of feeding itself. In relation to the butterfly, a caterpillar is an egg that crawls and can grow alone. So the paradox of insect life is this kind of walking egg. The caterpillar, once it has reached the desired size, transforms into a perfect egg this time, chasing, ceasing to move, Bec and becomes a being and power. So the cocoon built by the larva is this kind of postnatal egg. The life of insects, uh, from this point of view, is that of an egg that builds another egg. As another entomologist uh, uh, said, uh, uh, metamorphosis is the repetition of the development process that occurs during amorogenesis. In this hypothesis, then, the metamorphosis would be the evidence of the impossibility of moving away from, gestation, from the gestation phase for every, for every insect, 
because of metamorphosis, every uh, insect is condemned to remain partly a child. And childhood can never abandon uh, him, heat, sorry, and it can never part with it. So changing shape, metamorphosing, always means having the strength to make your body and neck capable of carving and conveying a new identity. All, in a way, and the, the, that could be a first conclusion. So all ego is an egg, and we are an ego itself only when we keep within ourselves that metamorphic power of which every egg is an expression. So metamorphosis is, uh, as I uh, try to show in a very con uh, um, a short uh, um, way, uh, made it possible to internalize the capacity for gestation. And it's this ability to address this capacity no longer simply to another living being, but on one's own life. Now, in a way, birth, and this kind of uh, uh, um, theory of our uh, reading of uh, insect metamorphosis, birth is actually the first and most universal form of metamorphosis. The ability of change your form is the ability to give birth to another living being. But the opposite, too, is true. The ability to give birth to another, another living being is the ability of changing your own form. So actually, every form of birth is a form of metamorphosis, perhaps the first and most universal one. That's why we can speak of birth and metamorphosis as two analogous processes. That's also why, exactly like in the case of metamorphosis, birth is also the evidence that two different bodies share one and the same life. And since everything is born, everything living being has actually taken the life it has from another living being, so that's the meaning of being born, then everything on earth share the one and the same life. So that's, in a way, the main argument of my talk. So, but let's go with the other. So let's try to speak about now about birth. Now, it is difficult to speak about birth, first of all, because, because I am a male, so I do not know this. Uh, uh, I have no ability to give birth to other people. So we'll talk about it as a person trying to remember what happened when I was born, which is extremely diff difficult. But it is difficult, difficult to speak about birth because birth is actually the most gigantic cultural black hole of our world. Partly because we have to forget it, we have to forget the moment of the birth. It is, in a way, the structural definition of birth is to forget what we were before birth. And partly, as I said, in a way, because we live in a culture produced by, and dominated by those who, by definition, have never had the experience of giving birth to others, that is, males. It is surely because of this that we are obsessed with death and aging, and we never speak about uh, um, birth. So when I, when I, just a little parenthesis, when I started to uh, study or to work about uh, birth, I just noticed that you have libraries about death. You have a lot of films, a lot of novels, a lot of uh, artworks, a lot of biological stuff, stuff about uh, why living uh, being are uh, um, dying, but there is so few stuff about birth. I mean, if you are asking you, just give me an example of a film about birth or a novel about birth, I mean, there is no such a huge, or there is, some, of course, we have knowledge about birth, but this knowledge is actually at the, at the, at the march of, of, of our cultural system is not just at the center. And one, 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 uh, one explanation or one reason of that is, of course, uh, the fact that women were excluded by, uh, from, from culture for a lot of centuries. So, uh, our society is still based on the culture of the dead. We carefully, carefully keep their bodies in sealed boxes. We erect mausoleums for them. We do not start cultivating the memory. 
we fill libraries with our thoughts on death, and birth, on the other hand, remains a mystery and a taboo. The millenary exclusion of women from the fields of speech and art has made it rare, difficult, inaudible to express and share this kind of astonishment at the emergence of a new self. The birth is barely celebrated collectively. We hardly talk about it. We hardly have collective rituals in order to share this event publicly, at least in Europe. We hardly pay attention to the traces that such an event lives on our bodies and souls. Everyone forgets their own birth. And yet someone do keep in their bodies uh, the opportunity to learn afterwards what, begin, what, what being born can mean for them, for mothers, and in this case, it doesn't matter if uh, human or non-human mothers, and I will speak about non-human motherhood so, uh, uh, because it's easier for me, uh, uh, but uh, we have to remember that birth is something which is nothing specifically human or non-human. It's really something which is perhaps the mass universal feature uh, in, uh, in, uh, in life. It is actually being born is the condition of possibility of being not natural and the other way around. What, when we are speaking about natural being, we are just telling that someone uh, was born. So that's the minimal definition of, uh, of, uh, of nature. Also from an, etym an etymological point of view, actually. Nature comes from the same uh, 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 root of, of to be born. Uh, so for, for mothers, uh, uh, to, uh, to be, uh, to, 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 uh, the meaning of being born is a physical, obvious, and immediate experience. Giving birth to others means rela relieving one's own birth in reverse. The true opposite from this point of view of birth is not death. It is seeing one's own body generate other bodies. To see one's body transformed into a matrix traversed by a life that is no longer personal or individual because it passes through and it's transmitted from one individual to another, from one body to another, without denying the individuality and the autonomy of both. Birth is exactly that the contemplation of the identity of life that animate two different persons. To give birth to someone means to see your life split up, form after form, organ by organ, breath after breath. To see one's body transformed in a sea where life migrates from ego to ego, from individual to individual, from gender to gender. The second body, which is born, which of us actually, hey, hey, each one of us actually, is born within the body of the mother and is at, at the same time a foreign body, an alien, and a twin body. It has a different phase, a deviant feature, because it is born from the fusion of two phases. Everyone, every other time, is even of a different gender, and yet it is uh, the body of the mother that the newborn domesticated and tamed. It is not simply a morphological analogy. There is a physical, material, spiritual continuity between the two bodies. Mother and child are for nine, nine months coextensive, while being two beings, two subjects, even legally, two lives, their bodies coincide in the res extensa, occupy the same space, are made of the same atoms, are one and the same flesh, which no longer belongs to either of them exclusively. It is the same continuity as partial coincidence that is accompanied by the autonomy uh, that is the transcendental form of what is called metamorphosis. Uh, and this is the metaphysical mystery of all births. The life that animates us is not exclusively ours. It can pass uh, to a body, uh, uh, from a body to another body, 
uh, from uh, 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 in, to an individual who will no longer share anything, diseases, tastes, experiences, opinion, death with us. It overflows our body, it transmigrates, it can multiply and detach itself from us like a seed that migrates elsewhere from the tree that generated it and from which it left. Life, this is the evidence of birth, is always ready to go elsewhere to build other bodies from our bodies. And pregnancy is the experience of this original multiplicity, which is intrinsic to all life. To live one's body as the co-extension of, of at least two subjects, two genders, two breaths that share and draw one and the same life. The one that has also animated the thousands of bodies that have generated us. Our life is never purely singular, unique, and divisible. That is why there is no and could never be a form of life, a transcendental unity between a life and its form. Birth is precisely the negation of this transcendental synthesis between form and life. We always come from another form. We are its deformation, variation, and amorphosis. Actually, the fact that we, have, uh, that we all have the same life doesn't mean that we are all identical. On the contrary, precisely we, because we all have the same life, we are all obliged to modify it, to change it, to adapt it. In order to understand that or to uh, uh, see that, look at your children or look at the children of other people. And I speak from experience because uh, it is the form of amazement that I always have, that always happens to me in front of my daughter. So in this case, I will speak about uh, uh, my daily uh, uh, life. So what, are, what, what is a child? A part of your body has differentiated it, uh, in at least two ways. It has joined a foreign body and has generated a life which is now outside yourself autonomous and separate from you. And the same could be said from the point of view of consciousness or mind. A part of your ego has escaped you and becomes different, other, unavailable. Your ego, your I, now exists outside of you, unlike you, forever improper for you. This other life that was yours now says, just like you, me, and it is literally the same piece of matter and the same piece of mind that you were. It was literally the same me that you embodied, you and that of your partner. Yet this life lives uh, elsewhere on inside through another body, or better said, in your body that has become something else. It says your I, your me, your ego, but it says it differently. It modulates differently those two egos that the second life has parasites, paratis, parasite, uh, para, how do you say in English? Paras, parasites, it, uh, yeah, okay, and mixed, uh, sorry. Every child is this, it is an ego, a me, a self that has become unrecognizable in front of its original self or its original I. And this is the destiny of every self, that of becoming unrecognizable. Reproduction is this process, is the process of becoming unrecognizable of the ego. Every child is a body that is imposed a metamorphosis on its original body, which was not uh, 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 their body. So the multiplication of bodies and self, what we call birth, is first of all a process of metamorphosis, both of bodies and of mind, but exactly through the same life. Because of birth, all living bodies, regardless of their shape, size, geographical location, species and kingdom, are a metamorphosis, a transformation of a previous body, a modification of a form that existed before them, a mutation that had, uh, uh, of a look, of a gaze that had already touched the world. What we call self 
the ability of a living body to be autonomous and reflective is, first of all, this power of appropriating life of a body, or, each, or rather each time a pair of life, or a pair of bodies, a pair of minds, that were not ours. Each of us has taken the body and the life of our parents into her or his hands, and we have changed their course, their DNA, their ego, their smile, their voices, their accents, are like deviated and drunk in our body. Being a son or being a daughter, that is being born, means above all this, being forced to become agents of metamorphosis of the bodies and lives of others. That of parents, that of the parents, but that also of the world. So this act of metamorphosis is the primary di dynamism of every ego. And that's also why life is so, is so difficult, because life is actually means to take the body of another person and to readapt this body and this uh, mind to a different condition. So we have, in a way, always broken bodies and always broken minds. That is, bodies and minds that are, are not adapted to the situation in which we are. Thanks to birth, we experience the uh, ego as an adherence and, uh, uh, to a uh, coincidence with the life of others, that of our mother, for example, or that of our father, a life which we have adopted and gradually domesticated. To be born means to have to say ego, I, me, always in the body, in the mind, and in the life of a different person. We have done so literally at least nine months in our lives, and we still do it. After all, our body, our DNA, our humanity is not definitively ours and will never be ours. It is no more natural and intimate to us than it was or it will be for others. It only becomes so through a process, a very long process of alteration and domestication, which allows us to become each time what we need to become. We must rebuild our bodies and our minds, our ideas, and we actually rebuild them completely. Being born means never being able to free oneself from the role of a body artist or of a psycho artist who never stops sculpting her body or his body, and her mind or his mind, to experiment with new ways of being in the world. Every being born Every me, every self, is composed and inhabited by this otherness, which can never be erased. And from this point of view, the concept of biological or genetic inheritance perfectly expresses this aspect. The most intimate and profound part of us, our most intimate genetic identity, comes from others. It was invented from, by others. The inheritance expresses the possibility of, of appropriating and modifying what belongs to others. The ego, the ego, the self, is always an inheritance. It only means to be forced to hatch within something that comes from somewhere out of us without ever being able to be oneself and without ever being able to merge or to dissolve completely in this otherness. Now, what we saw from metamorphosis and birth is actually the process that allows life to differentiate, to produce diversity through itself and from itself in general. For, million, for millions of years, life itself has been transmitted from body to body, from individual to individual, from species to species, from kingdom to kingdom. Certainly, it changed shapes, it changes place, it transforms itself. But the life of every living being does not begin with, it, uh, with its birth. It is always much older. Consider your lives. The life that you imagine as the most intimate and incommunicable thing in you does not come from you. It is not exclusive or personal. It has been transmitted to you by others and has animated other bodies, other pieces of matter besides what you consider your home, your body. 
for, as you said, this this uh, this experience is extremely evident in in uh, uh, during the uh, gestation. So. Uh, uh, for nine months, this an inappropriateness and in, in, inassignability of life that animates and flows within you has been a physical evidence. You have, uh, you have, be, you have been the same mix of bodies, moods, and atoms of, uh, of your mother. You are the same life, the same body, uh, um, and, the, uh, and, and so on. On the other hand, if your life starts long before we are born, it also ends long after death. Our breath will not run out in our carbs. It will feed all those who will find it uh, in it a meal to celebrate. Not even our humanity is original, is an original and autonomous product. It is also an extension and metamorphosis of a previous life. More precisely, the human form is an invention that primates, another form of life, have been able to produce from their bodies, from their breath, from their DNA, from the way of life, to make the life that inhabited uh, uh, them exist differently. It is uh, they, so apes, who have transmitted this form to us, and through the form of human life, it is always apes that are, in a way, continuing to live in us. Primates themselves, moreover, are nothing more than a, an experiment, a bed launched by other species and by other forms of life. Evolution is a kind of musket ball, ball that takes place over time. And this allows us all species from age to age to hide from those who created them and sons and daughters uh, um, not, uh, not, uh, not to be recognized by the parents and no longer recognize the parents. Yet despite the change of the mask, the mother species and the daughter species are a metamorphosis of the same life. Each species is a mosaic of pieces taken from other species. We, the living species, had never stopped uh, exchange its parts, lines, organs, and watch what each of us is, uh, what we call species, is just the set of techniques that each living being has borrowed from others. It is be because of this continuity of, in transformation that each species is a bricolage, a patchwork of other living forms. Each species is, this is actually the uh, the, the definition of uh, what Darwin called evolution. So evolution is the, the idea that each species is actually a metamorphosis of a previous existing species. So for instance, and, 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 and in a way, it, it is always carrying the uh, previous uh, features of, the, of, the, of all the forms that life has to pass through in order to produce uh, the uh, uh, this uh, particular species. So each species is a metamorphosis of all those who preceded it. It is the same life that has tinkered with a new body, a new form, to be able to exist differently. So look at your body. There is nothing specifically human about having eyes. You share this form with thousands of other species. Look at your nose, for instance. You share this shape also with other thousands of uh, other species as well. You are never, and you were never, entirely human. You are a multi-specific mosaic. You are a little bit bacterial, a little bit viral, a little bit monkey, a little bit fish. And each of us, each of you, is a traveling zoo, actually. Every self is a strange multi-species menagerie. To put it in a much more direct way, biodiversity is not something existing outside yourself. It is the form of your body, the form of your genetic code, as the body of every living species. This is the deepest meaning of Darwinian evolutionary theory that biology and public discourse do not want to hear. Species are not substances, real entities. They are game of life in the same sense 
in which we speak of a linguistic game of our discourses, unstable and necessarily ephemeral configurations of a life that loves to cross and pass from one form to another. We have not yet drawn all the consequences of Darwinian intuition, affirming that species are linked by a genealogical relationship does not simply mean affirming that living beings constitute a large family or clan. This means, above all, that uh, to affirm that the identity of each species is actually purely relative. If monkeys or apes are the parents and human beings are the children, then, this is very strange but very interesting, then human are human only in front of monkeys. Uh, uh, exactly as each of us is a son or a daughter only in front of his father and not uh, absolutely. So, it's, so the, species, the idea of species, the uh, specific identity has the same, in a way, status of the identity of being a child or being a, 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 a parent and so on, or being a cousin and so on. It's exactly the same. That is the, actually the consequence of, uh, of the Darwinian intuition, in a way. Uh, uh, each specific identity exclusively defines, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot. Oh, I Each specific identity exclusively defines the formula of continuity and metamorphosis with other species. It is on this point that Dar Darwinism, if read as a consequent and radical way, in a consequent and radical way, could coincide with what contemporary anthropology has managed to understand through the analysis uh, of Amazonian cultures. I'm uh, um, taking reference to Eduardo Vivares de Castro. So if the relationship among individuals belonging to the same species coincides through the birth with the relationship among species, uh, if there is a perfect analogy between the birth of an individual and the genesis of a new species, uh, so the, the specific birth, and everything is a form of metamorphosis, then the taxonomy of species cannot be considered a natural fact, but must be viewed as one of the patterns of kinship that allows us to classify human cultures. So the relationship among living beings is a cultural form of kinship that has to be renegotiated every time, exactly like our relationship to our mother or our father has to be shaped and rene renegotiated every time, actually. There is just, uh, yeah, uh, 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 there is just an interesting difference uh, in comparison to human uh, system of kinships. Evolution is the system of kinship that results from the acceptance and the universalization of incest uh, and not from its exclusion. It is as if by radicalizing intraspecific incest and interspecific cannibalism, life on Earth has found a formula for infinite transformation and metamorphosis. This perspective, and I will conclude, imposes a series of conclusions from both an epistemological and a, a political point of view. First of all, if every species is intrinsically interspecific, contrary to what we have believed and repeated for a century, every knowledge and science at every moment of its development, at every geographical and cultural latitude, is a form of totemism. One could say that it is always by observing the non-human that humanity and any other species can and will understand its, its, itself. All knowledge about our lives can only be borrowed from observation of other life species. And on the contrary, all self-consciousness is always interspecific. And this is also true, uh, and, and, and also the opposite is true. It is by applying the concepts that describe our lives that we can, we, we have understood the life of species and uh, forms, uh, life forms that are different from, uh, from us. Totemism and anthropomorphism, from this point of view, are two identical processes. 
if we discover that part of our life is identical to that of non-humans, we can recognize futures of humanity in other forms of life, and conversely, each time that we attribute a human trait to a plant or an animal, we also recognize that there is something in us that does not possess a purely human nature. And both processes are structurally necessary. They, uh, they exist because if, if each species is defined as a minim minimal modification of a species that preceded it, then any knowledge of a single species is constitu constitutively antispecific. In a way, all knowledge is totemic because there can be no knowing that it is not borrowed from other living species. And vice versa, any self-knowledge is always a knowledge of other life forms because each life form is always multispecific, a patchwork of several forms of life. Thank you so much.